Good evening. My name is Roberta McWoods, a 35 year educator in the Kirkwood School District, retired teacher and master mentor for teachers of color. And also one of your moderators for this evening's presentation, Eugenics and Ideology of Hate and an Education of Fear. Hopefully you're all intrigued um, about this topic tonight and you will get to hear a lot of it tonight. I'm going to um, let you know that our, our mission for the Kirkwood Educational Equity Speaker Series is to provide a safe space for Kirkwood School District staff, students and school communities to have courageous conversations around systemic racism that affects black, indigenous and students of color with the objectives of increasing equity for black and brown students and closing opportunity gaps. It is our hope that participants become enlightened inspired and more self-aware as they work to improve the lives of all students through the enhancement of social, emotional, economic, civic, and educational outcomes. I'm now going to turn it over to Dr. Shonda Ambers Phillips, uh, Director of Student Services for the Kirkwood School District. Good evening and welcome. My name is Dr. Shonda Ambers Phillips, and as Ms. McWood said, I am the Executive Director of Student Services in Kirkwood School District, focusing on equity, wellness, and inclusion. One of my responsibilities at the district office is to facilitate the Educational Equity Task Force, which is a group that reconvened in 2015 in the spring, it was directed by the Board of Education to study and to eliminate the opportunity gap which exists between our white and our black students in Kirkwood School District. Realizing that this work was um, it, it encompassed so much more than just our test scores and refusing to view our students in a deficit model, we in the Educational Equity Task Force set out to identify all of the areas which impacted student success. I'm going to share my screen briefly with you because the task force actually worked to generate 65 initial action steps to eliminate um, our opportunity gap. And these action steps fell into seven different general themes or objectives. The first thing we wanted to do was to learn from others, which I think is the spirit of our speaker series. Number two, we wanted to ensure that our systems, our practices and our policies were equitable, which um, we're doing a deep dive into that work right now. Number three, we wanted to engage our community to build shared ownership and responsibility for the success of all of our students, which is one of the reasons why these webinars are open to individuals outside of Kirkwood School District orders. Number four, we will exhibit shared leadership that is courageous, collaborative, and transformative, which that's thinking creative and doing things a little bit different. Number five, we will ensure that our staff members are successfully meet the very needs of diverse learners, whether that's restorative practices or trauma-informed care, um, or learning how to develop and um, engage students virtually. Number six, we will teach into an inclusive curriculum that represents and respects diverse cultures and promotes rigorous and relevant instruction for all. So students can see themselves in the curriculum, through a mirror, and then also they can see um, through windows to the outside world. Number seven, we will ensure that all learning environments are inclusive and reflect of commitment to the success of our students. And that is merely just to ensure that all of our students feel a sense of belonging in our schools. Now I'm going to pitch it back over to my co-moderator, Ms. Roberta McWoods, to introduce our esteemed speaker for this evening. Yes, I'm so excited to introduce to you this evening. I won't say a lot about him. I'll let him introduce himself, but Dr. Vernon C. C. Mitchell is the product of the McClure, of Ferguson Florissant School District and also a, um, the son of the late um, Vernon Mitchell, senior principal at Berkeley, McClure South Berkeley High School. And he is, I have to have to uh, fellow alumni, uh, Mizzou, M-I-Z, Dr. Dr. Mitchell, <laughs> we know that means B -O -U. B -O -U. Uh, a Cornell graduate as well, and a professor at Washington University, uh, and a lecturer in American Culture Studies, curator of popular American arts 
uh, the Olin Library. So I am going to stop now and let him have the rest this evening. So let's get ready to hear all about eugenics. Good evening to everybody that's that's uh, watching and listening to me. Um, can, can everybody hear me okay? Oh no. Yes, you, we can hear you. You're great. Okay, because I, I can't uh, see myself right now. Yeah, you're good. Um, uh, okay, so thank you for the, the gracious introduction. I, I'm really happy to be here. Um, Mrs. McWoods, um, Dr. Phillips have been great and I'm really uh, excited about uh, sharing some of my thoughts uh, with you this, this evening. Um, the goal of this presentation is really just to have, provide context to a broader conversation that could lead, I would hope at some point to uh, some action. Uh, I don't believe in just uh, what I tell my students all the time is that I'm here to empower you to think critically about the world around you, not to have you to think as I think. And um, this evening is no different. So um, thank, to the, thank you to the Kirkwood uh, School District uh, for this opportunity. Um, I think there should be more um, events like this that bring uh, folks from our community to our community. Right. So and what I mean by that is that, you know, typically you don't see college professors or uh, staff members like myself, uh, university. I don't think you see us enough in these situations. And so it's my, my hope that uh, this is this, the beginning of uh, more types of interactions in this regard. So uh, without further ado, I'll, I'll get started. Um, eugenics, an ideology of hate and an education of fear. Um, in 2016, um, I showed a video uh, to my students. It's not coming up here. Well, that's waiting to come up. Um, the, the, the students I had in this course, it was the course was on um, race, social media, I uh, race media and, and social movements, and um, they didn't believe what they were seeing. Um, they thought it was a joke. And it looks like I'm having some difficulty here. Uh, but what I was going to show you was that in, on August 8th, uh, 1925, 40,000 members of the Ku Klux Klan marched on Pennsylvania Avenue, very orderly, uh, very organized. Um, and they didn't, I mean, they had on their regalia and people came out to see this event. And what you should understand is that this event was not kind of shunned as something that was un-American. They were seen as quintessentially American at this point. Um, and, you know, showing this to my, my students, um, oh, I think I'm having some technical difficulties here. Uh, my yeah. apologies. Is the video yeah. coming back up? Um, I think we can try to pull his video for him. Uh, his videos if he's having some difficult difficulty. So, let's see. Let's see if he tries that. If not, maybe one of us can pull the video up for him. That might be. Let us know. Okay, I, I'm. Uh pulling it back up again now. My, okay. my apologies to, to everyone. Um, and those happen, so we'll just, we'll roll, we'll roll with it. Okay. Because I right. think that the video would be very powerful if we can get that up for everyone to see. We'll let you know when your screen is being shared. Okay. Sharing now, so the, so the presentation is up. Okay. 
I, I apologize. It's okay. I give for that. That's all right. I actually think when I showed my slide, it knocked yours off. So that's probably my fault. Oh, yeah. Okay. We're good. Okay. We're good. All right. So we're, we're back. So as I was saying, um, August 8th, 1925. Um, and this video will show because I think it's, it's incredibly powerful to see um, this display. Looks like it's trying to come up. <laughs> yeah. So, I, somebody I, does not want us to see this video. Well, the video is on YouTube. I mean, everything that I'm going to tell you today, you can go look up on your own. Um, I, I'm not pulling anything from any uh, sources that aren't available to you. Anything that's not available, uh, I will make available to the district so that you can look um, at the same materials that I looked at as I put this uh, presentation together, uh, this lecture. Yeah. So uh, I'll just skip If your the videos, next there it looks like it's trying to show. There we go. Okay. Coming up. Now. Oh, yeah. It's okay. You got the, the steel photo. Well, I'll, I'll show you the, 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 this is the Washington Post uh, from August 9th, uh, 1925. So a day after. Um, in the, one of the headlines is Pennsylvania Avenue, mass of white during Klansman parade. This is the front page. Um, and I think it's also worth noting that most of the people who were uh, members of the Ku Klux Klan that were meeting on this day were mostly from the Midwest, uh, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and, you know, that would cross over into, uh, you know, the, the eastern borders, I should say, in some regard, but um, it wasn't a large representation of the American South, uh, though I think there were some that were there. The majority of uh, these participants came from America's heartland, so to speak. And so I just wanted you to see the just what the kind of impact that this event had on the people that were able to, to see it. Um, and if you look at the bottom of the screen, at the bottom of this, this page, right, this, this big picture, um, you see folks in hats, and, and they, are, they aren't jeering and, and uh, uh, yelling epithets uh, at these folks. They are there to witness this, uh, this scene. Um, I think for some people, it was a wonder. For other people, it was in support. Um, and again, this is in D.C., 40,000 men, women, and children. And they have their masks up. They aren't, their face is not covered, as we typically think about the Ku Klux Klan. They, they are very much proud of their, uh, them belonging to the organization. And this has more to do with this moment in American history. Uh, people tend to, the, to think of the 1920s or the early decades of the 20th century as really, uh, you know, the roaring 20s. America's going through this boom um, in economics, uh, you think about jazz music, you think about um, Harlem and New York City, right, Chicago and in DC. Um, but at the same time, and we think about progressive movements, which uh, we think about opening up the body politic to persons and people that have been historically written out or excluded from participation in said body politic. But just as much as there was this uh, excitement about what was happening with America, there also was, uh, America had to reckon with uh, these racial issues um, and, and what it meant to be a citizen, right? Who, who was that portal of citizenship open to? Who was gonna participate? And this is overwhelmingly telling you that it was going to be persons that were white or believe themselves to be white. Now I'm going to show you a, a quick video. Well, it was.
media is unavailable. Well, we'll keep going. Um, th what I was going to show you was a um, a whistleblower at a facility, a, a healthcare facility that is on one of our southern borders, and uh, the nurse in question that was working then uh, had alleged uh, part of her whistleblower complaint where that they were uh, immigrant women who were having hysterectomies, um, you know, against their will. And this initially to hear something like this is, is you know, jaw dropping. It is uh, very, uh, it's right there with hearing about children being separated from their parents, uh, children being in cages. Um, and so my point in even mentioning this is that some of the things that we would uh, think about happening in, in like at the turn of the 20th century are occurring today. Executive Order uh, 13769, the, the quote unquote Muslim ban. Um, Muslims being banned temporarily uh, from ending America soon after 2015, uh, after the uh, Bernardino terrorist attack. It drew heavy criticism, but there were people that supported this. And so this takes me to the part about like, what is eugenics? Most people hear this term and they may, you know, uh, in passing say, oh yeah, I've heard of that, but they couldn't tell you what it was, right? Um, and that's okay. That's why I'm here to kind of talk you through it. So eugenics uh, comes from the Greek root uh, for good the words, right? And for origin or, or good birth is another way to think about it. And it involves applying principles of genetics and heredity for the purpose of improving the human race. The term was first coined by Francis Galton in the late 1800s. Um, Galton was an intellectual uh, and most of his work dealt with uh, the field of statistics, psychology, meteorology, and also genetics. And he was a, a relative of uh, Charles Darwin. He was a cousin of Charles Darwin. And most people think of Charles Darwin, they think of the origin of species or the survival of the fittest, uh, that, that term. So I guess he was keeping it in the family. One of the things he says in um, Heredity Genius is that consequently it is easy to obtain by careful selection a permanent breed of dogs or horses gifted with particular, with peculiar uh, powers of running or doing anything else so it would be quite practicable to produce a highly gifted race of men by judicious marriages during several consecutive generations. So what he's saying here is that he believes that they can create a uh, almost like super people or they're trying to uh, breed humans for, you know, uh, to, for intellect, for uh, and he's making this correlation between the way that animals are bred. Um, and I grew up around horses, so I, I, you know, I know that people look for different traits in animals uh, when they want to uh, see that in another generation, to have temperament, to have um, a mentality. Uh, but to see this applied to people, again, is very jarring. But this was you know, an accepted practice at the time. And this is, um, Galton was in Europe. He's, in, he's in, uh, in England, as a matter of fact. So he is thinking about this in terms of how do we make the best version of ourselves? But inherently there's a problem there, right? Uh, what if you don't fall into the realm of what they believe to be their, you know, uh, their equals? Um, so, this movement uh, or eugenics as a, as a term or as a, as a study comes to the USA. Um, and it, be, it becomes a, a full-blown movement, an intellectual movement and a social movement. And it took root, you know, in the early 1900s, uh, Charles Davenport was a, a key figure um, 
he was a prominent uh, biologist. And then you had Harry Laughlin, uh, who was a former teacher and a principal. And so here's an education piece coming in, who was interested in human breeding. Now, there's a kind of a, a local connection um, that I'd be remiss if I didn't mention it, but Harry Laughlin was, uh, although born in Iowa, he grew up in Kirksville, uh, Missouri, where Truman State University is. When it was, um, I think Kirk, Kirksville norm, Normal School was where, like when he graduated. Um, and then he went on to pursue a PhD in, I, I believe, zoology or animal science at Princeton University. So these individuals are not, you know, I, I don't want you to think about them as being on the fringes uh, or that people looked at them as something to scoff at or, or to be embarrassed of. They were very, very open about doing this and they had support. They, these guys were giving lectures all over the world and all over the country. And it was beginning to affect the way that um, education was, was being seen in America from, from universities all the way down to secondary and primary education. Uh, another figure that was important is Madison Grant. He is kind of like a, uh, he, he speaks more than, than most of, of these individuals. And in his book, The Passing of the Great Race becomes like a quintessential, like must read by folks who believe in this type of ideology. Um, and uh, the full name is The Passing of the Race or the Racial uh, Basis of European History. Um, and the, the picture I'm showing you is the inside the jacket cover. And it's, you know, I think it's a fourth edition by this point fourth revised edition with a documentary, uh, a documentary supplement. So and it's 1921. So this is popular, right? This is not just, again, so I on the fringes uh, that people are, are kind of looking at and, you know, rolling their eyes. They are very much interested in doing this. I also must take a moment to talk about the notion of, of uh, Darwinism, right, happening at this moment. I kind of mentioned it earlier, uh, Charles Darwin, uh, fittest, uh, survival of the fittest, but this becomes a, a very uh, seductive mentality amongst some nations to develop or intellectuals across the world that believe at this point that we have to create uh, the best version of ourselves physically to develop these, you know, uh, and, and there's, of course, uh, these heteronormative, you know, uh, things that are happening here. Of course, all these men that I'm, I'm telling you about, the people, individuals I'm, I'm telling you about are, are white men. Um, and this pseudoscience that they create, because none of this stuff that, that they say and articulate is scientifically true, but it lays the foundation for things that we'll see later, like the bell curve. Uh, when we think about intelligence tests, all this stuff was predicated on, on these early uh, writings and going back to Galton to now. Uh, on some level, you might say or, or might want to think that, well, maybe it was developed in a particular ignorance about, uh, well, how can we manipulate genetics to do a certain thing? And if that was the case, well, why don't you talk about that for everybody? How do we do something that can um, ensure health and well-being for all humanity? They weren't talking about that. They are only talking about people that look like them. Um, and then I should also say that in Europe, it was more so predicated, uh, it was centered around class. So Galton did not want to, uh, he wanted to develop the, this master race, so to speak, from the social betters, those uh, elite members of uh, European society, of, of, of uh, English society. When it comes to America, it's not just about um, how do we become better or this class uh, differentiation. There's also a racial component that is much different and in some respects, much more insidious. Um, and that becomes the clarion call for when you see, so I go back to the the the, uh, the Ku Klux Klan marching 
in, in Washington, D.C. in 1925. In 1915, 1914, you have D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation. Uh, Birth of a Nation was a film that was um, mentioned by Time Magazine to be the most important film of the 20th century. It also, and, and so it, it, for those that have never seen it, it details the, the, the rise of the Ku Klux Klan and why it's important. The protection of, of whiteness, there is a, it, it is honestly probably the most um, successful piece of racist propaganda ever created. And those images that were created were endearing and they still sit with us today. The archetypes that were created around African-Americans as being lazy, as being uh, um, intellectually inferior, as being uh, uh, like lustful and uh, easy, uh, or all the negative connotations and socio-politically and economically that, that are associated to African-Americans historically, these archetypes, the Sambo, the tragic mulatto, the coon, all these things emerge from this film. That film also helped to shore up the eugenics movement at the same time. So you need to think about this as like a full court press and pushing to the center, to the front, to the fore, a notion about America being a democracy for and by persons of Anglo descent. And that's where Madison Grant comes into play. That's why his, his picture is back up there. Uh, he, he only was interested in Anglo-Saxons. And that notion about uh, success of, of, of America, or when you hear America first, um, this is the, the beginnings, the rumblings of that. And it's emerging in these organizations like uh, the Ku Klux Klan and, and some others. Again, so uh, Madison Grant and um, Charles Davenport, Harry Laughlin, they are all uh, part of an organization um, that begins to, I mean, like they're accepted as, again, part of, of American uh, society, not as some kind of offshoot or it's some, like all oh, these guys are crazy. Why, why are they even doing this? It was accepted. Now here's where it gets even more um, insidious. When we think about the type of terminologies that I'm discussing, when you're talking about um, a master race, the first thing that comes to mind for most people would be the Nazis. Well, the Nazis got most of their propaganda or the thought for this from the individuals I just told you about. Because the other thing that I didn't, I failed to mention as I was saying this is that um, Grant, Davenport and Laughlin are also very much tied to public policy. They are making public policies um, that are, are dealing with um, forced uh, hysterectomies of people, individuals that are viewed as, uh, you know, not part of society, uh, undesirables. Um, and Hitler sees this and begins to use this on, for immigration into Germany. Um, and so he takes their ideologies and he runs with it. So this is the educational piece that I say is also, you know, a part of the fear that's happening. Um, and there are three major influences that eugenics had on American education. Uh, the, the first uh, of, of these is a debate between John Dewey and David uh, Sneddon uh, that resulted in this tracking system that separated college-bound students and vocational students, students that were fit for college and people that weren't fit for college. So that is all happening around the same time. It also established a framework, a hierarchical framework in public school curriculum that certain students would not be in certain classes, not because they weren't capable, but because they were inherently incapable of, of, of being, of doing the work. Um, so it's kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy. And there's also the emergence of standardized testing. And when you begin to think about these, the influence of, uh, of, of eugenics, the persons who begin to suffer the most are African-Americans. 
um, as well as immigrant populations that are coming from um, Eastern Europe too, uh, and other, other places that are seen as non-native uh, persons are seen as uh, the, the Irish go through this, that they're viewed as, uh, as being not capable or not able to sustain what the, uh, the, the American, uh, the quintessential Americanness, uh, or what that what that embodies, right? And so, uh, as we begin to think about the ways that education is facilitated, because this is also the beginning of public education, that there is a self fulfilling prophecy for persons who are not who are immigrants to this country or are like African Americans seen or viewed as categorically as other. And so this is another thing that's creating um, these systems that will continue to uh, kind of really destroy any notion of opportunity for those who are not seen as, as part of uh, what it meant to be American. And again, I want you to understand that this was not seen as like, oh, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with this. This what's, what's the problem? Of course, America is uh, what some scholars might call a harem book democracy. Again, a democracy, a republic for and by those who believe themselves to be white uh, or, or, or for one particular segment of the population. However you want to term that, right? In this case, it's, it's those, uh, if we go back to Madison Grant and, and the kind of pamphlets and the books and the courses these folks are teaching, um, I can show you uh, there's a eugenics, uh, like they have a, a, this organization and they list all of the courses that are being taught in eugenics around the country in 1925. Uh, there are eugenics courses taught right here in St. Louis at Washington University Med School, okay? Um, there were eugenics courses taught in a bunch of Ivy League schools too. You know, so this is, again, I don't want you to think about this as some type of conspiratorial moment with a bunch of yahoos who are coming up with these ideas. These uh, men are coming from the most prestigious, most well-respected institutions in the country. And they are creating policies and procedures that will have impacts well into the 21st century. So even, uh, even today. So, you know, as I said, you know, it, it wasn't simply this kind of, you know, academic uh, or for the academic elite was a central part of what many local American school district uh, policies were, uh, policy makers were thinking about. Um, this was just accepted. And as I said before, it, it's still with us today. Um, there's a Northern California study that was done in, in May of 2019 that uh, correlates the usage of eugenics and, and the ideologies in terms of its uh, response to penalizing uh, African-American students for, um, in terms of, of dealing with suspension rates and uh, also uh, engaging with what they expected these students to do. So again, this notion of self-fulfilling prophecy, we are going to make a curriculum and a response to discipline that's going to be harsh uh, because we believe this is what's supposed to happen. I won't get into the particulars of the study. I'll make it available at, after this is over, but um, it's anecdotally, this is one of those situations where this is 2019 and there's still, there are some places that are using um, these old ideologies in this new place. So it's like, uh, as, as some folks would say, the same soup just reheated. Um, so suspensions, and I should say, let me back up again. Nomenclature is important. Uh, in the 1920s, they're using terms like idiots, they're calling people that they're, they're uh, undesirables. They change that and they, they, the term becomes at risk. How do we deal with at, our, our at risk students, right? And so when you hear that, that has a different connotation too. Just as you heard me say it, I told you, what does an at risk student look like? 
what would you what comes to your mind so again just an, another way that you you see these ideologies continually being part of of our education and it, it's also part of the memory of the nation because if we look at the the recent election we see that over 70 million people were okay with policies that were created by the current administration. That's not to speak ill of or support of that administration, but just to say that there are people who were okay with it. That wasn't a deal breaker for them, right? To see this type of, of ideology, to see this type of um, these policies being enacted. But I wanna show you something that hopefully this video works um, this is Professor uh, Eddie Glaude, who is uh, the chair of the African American Studies Department at Princeton University. Um, and Vernon, it, if it does not work, I did pull it up and I'll share my screen. So awesome. we're, having, Thank you. we're having so many technical difficulties. Yeah, so, and I, I'll, again, I apologize for that. No, it's not your fault. It just happened. So let's try it. And if not, I will uh, get uh, my video going. Okay, so... Uh, this is actually August of 2019 um, that Professor Glaude uh, is saying this is after a, a, a mass shooting. Uh, he makes this commentary during uh, this news show. I think you may have some of the same issues. Going yeah, on. I think if you could share your screen, I think I'll that's... share my screen and okay. we'll we'll um, we'll uh, we'll get it going because like this is this is a pretty powerful video. So hopefully everybody can see this. I mean, you know, America is not unique in its sins hmm. as a country. We're not unique in our evils, to be honest with you. Um, I think where we where we may be singular is our refusal to acknowledge them. Mm. And the legends and myths we tell about our inherent, you know, goodness uh, to hide and cover and conceal so that we can maintain a kind of willful ignorance that protects our innocence. See, the thing is that when we, the Tea Party was happening, we used people, were, we were saying pundits, oh, it's just about economic populism. <laughs> it's not about barriers. When people knew, people knew, social scientists were already writing that what was driving the Tea Party were anxieties about Economic demographic anxiety. shifts, that the country was changing, that they were seeing these racially ambiguous babies on, on Cheerios commercials, that the country wasn't quite feeling like it was a white nation anymore. And people were screaming from the top of their lungs, yo, this is not just simply economic populism. This is the ugly underbelly of the country. See, the thing is, is this, and I'll say this, and I'll take the hit on it. There are communities that have had to bear the brunt of America confronting, white Americans confronting the danger of their innocence. And it happens every generation. So somehow we have to kind of, oh my God, is this who we are? And just again, another, here's another generation of babies. Think about it, a two-year-old had his bro bones broken by two parents trying to shield him from being killed. A woman who has been married to this man for as long as I've been on the planet almost, lost her, lost her husband. For what? And so what we know is that the country has been playing politics for a long time on this hatred. We know this. So it's easy for us to place it all on Donald Trump's shoulders. It's easy for us to place Pittsburgh on his shoulders. It's easy for me to place Charlottesville on his shoulders. It's easy for us to place El Paso on his shoulders. This is us. And if we're gonna get past this, we can't blame it on him. He's a manifestation of the ugliness that's in us. I've had the privilege of growing up in a tradition that didn't believe in the myths and the legends because we had to bear the brunt of them. Either we're going to change, Nicole, or we're gonna do this again and again, and babies are going to have to grow up without mothers and fathers, uncles and aunts, friends, while we're trying to convince white folk to finally leave behind a history that will 
maybe, maybe, or embrace a history that might set them free from being white. Finally. Wow. Yeah, so that's that's um, very powerful uh, stuff there. And, you know, I think that Professor Glaude is, right, how do we begin to deal with the situation that what we're currently in when we look at um, American education? Um, and a lot of it is is predicated around how can we be prescriptive in this moment to better serve uh, the students in public education, you know, across America. And so the question I think we are dealt with that we have to, to deal with, if, if we believe that this is us, now what are we going to do about it? And I have been... Uh, I've been able to be where I am and be who I am because there were a coalition of folks that believed in me and pushed me when I wanted to give up. But how many, how do we get to a place where that is the norm and that's not the exception? Um, I called this, I, I, I termed this uh, as I did, um, this presentation, because I think eugenics arose because those persons who believed in it needed something, they created something to help them deal with whatever guilt and anxiety they had. It wasn't about, again, opening the doors of opportunity for humanity. It was about exclusion when it happened in America. And it manifested itself in every way possible. And it was part of, um, from secondary education all the way to the Ivy Leagues, right? This is occurring. And so I leave you with the thought, when you look at this, and it's, it's, this is not to, it's to give context to where we are. We didn't just end up here. It didn't just happen uh, by osmosis. This is part of a long, sordid history of investment in the myths and legends that he talked about. And at this point, you know, what are we going to do about it? And I do mean we, not just teachers, not just administrators uh, and other staff members, not just the community, but what are we going to collectively do so that the narrative about who we are is not totally based around our contradictions as a society and as a nation. Thank you for your time this evening and mm -hmm. I look forward to any questions you have. Wow, so um, I think, are you still sharing your screen, Dr. Mitchell? Yeah, I, I can. Uh, yeah, if you can. So we have some questions that we, we would like to unpack and, and hopefully you all have some questions. And like I said earlier, no question is too silly to ask. I mean, maybe there are some things that you didn't understand um, that didn't make sense to you. Uh, please feel free to use the chat uh, to, to um, unpack that questions. But we have a couple that we are going to ask you, um, uh, Shonda and myself, before we take some questions from our attendees. Dr. Shonda Amherst Phillips, would you like to go um, first? Yes, um, Dr. Mitchell, I just want to let you know that I dropped both of those videos in the chat. And so people will have an opportunity Great. to go Great. back and see Thank the video um, from uh, 1925 of the plan. And they'll also have the video. I found the other video um, as well. And so one of my questions is going to speak to that original video about the march um, in, on Washington. But the first question that I have is this summer, our Kirkwood community had an opportunity to participate in a book study. Um, how to Be an Anti-Racist, and it was Ibram X. Kendi's uh, book, and the text specifically spoke to racist policies, um, and he defined, Kendi defined what that actually means. He says it's any measure that produces or sustains racial inequity between racial groups, 
And so he talked about these policies could be written or they could be unwritten. They could be rules, procedures, processes, regulations, guidelines that govern our people. And so thinking about students and policies, no school district sets out, there's not an intention to you know, create racist policies, but we do know that students are disproportionately impacted by some of the policies that we have in, in, in districts. And so how does this affect American education today? Um, you spoke about discipline as one of them, and how, what, how might we see ourselves as like change agents to operate different? I, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, and it, there's no uh, real simple answer to it. Um, but I think that at the, the beginning part of that has to be centered around um, personal investment in being a change agent, right? How do we get to that place? Um, I grew up in public education in, in St. Louis County in the Ferguson Florida School District. Shout out to anybody from Ferguson Florida that is uh, watching this that knows me and knew my dad. Um, and I can honestly say that my teachers were invested in all of our successes, right? Um, the kids that were performing really well, that was great. But I saw teachers who were invested in making sure all the kids were great relative to where they are. And I, I think that when we make policies that are punitive, um, that don't take into consideration uh, the context to a student, and let me take the student part out. When you take out the context to a child's life, because student makes it seem like it's not a person. When you say child, it begins to resonate with you a different way. And kind of like one of the last slides I said, what are we going to do? We have to have that. We has to talk about these kids. What are we going to do to help our kids? And I don't think that American public education has to be like a silver bullet to fix everything. That, that's not what I'm suggesting at all. Um, but when I look at what my dad and his generation did, for those folks that, 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 that were in Kenlock Public Schools, shout out to Kenlock. Um, I'm part of that legacy and I wear it proudly. Um, th that was a situation where, you know, my father and anybody that used class in 1970, so shout out to them too. But they always, I was so jealous of hearing these stories about these teachers and these administrators who were invested in them in ways that I had, I, I dreamed about that happening. And I had a really good, you know, education, without a doubt. I cannot complain about it at all. But I think to deal with our current moment, we have to look at the whole child and how do we put resources in place to allow that child to be its best self, right? Um, as, as they deal with the, 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 the myriad uh, facets of their identity and their own righteous mind, how do we put them in a place to succeed, right? Um, as teachers, as administrators, as, as staff persons, as parents, right? It's not just like I had really active parents and, and anybody knows my family, they know all my cousins, we, you know, it, you always saw Mitchell's up at the school. Well, for persons that don't have those active parents, you have to have active, active teaching. You have to have active, right? You get where I'm going with that. And so I think that's the investment that has to, that has to be at play. And, and some people will, will say, well, I have sweat equity in, in, involved in this. I do for my students. I, I, I'm not saying that people don't do that. But if we're going to keep having these discussions uh, in that the study that I, that I talked about, that was in, uh, it's out of San Francisco. Um, the, 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 the person that wrote it, the author, bemoans that every uh, summer they would look at the attendance rates, they would look at the uh, suspension rates, and they would be left feeling like they had not done anything because the achievement gap was increasing. Right, uh, especially for uh, Latinx and African American students, and so how do we address this? And I think that's what really what I think your question, you know, gets at. And so I think the policies that are created have to be policies that take into account 
the whole of a person, the whole of, 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 a, of a child, and the whole of their parents, you know, the, the household that they're coming from. Again, the takeaway is not to say that if we do this, American education can save every, no. This has to be all hands on deck all of the time. And when people get tired, I know folks who are in secondary education and, and some of them are tired. Um, just like we talk about heroes that are, that are in, in our emergency and trauma rooms, um, uh, hospitals, especially in this moment, you know, our educators are in a, a similar position. And guess what? So are parents. And so how do we create a situation, a platform that empowers everybody or allows for a voice uh, to exist that empowers folks, but also creates a sense of accountability and activeness, like an engagement with this child so that child can be, uh, again, the, the best version of itself. Thank wow, thank you. So there are there are quite a few questions. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna ask this one before I uh, take a couple of questions that were sent to me. Um, we talked. You, you spoke earlier about the standardized testing, and that's always a big issue. Standardized testing, um, and 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 I know we've learned through COVID that there were some universities that decided to waive the SATs and ACTs. However, um, they were not really for the reasons that we we've always known that they're biased, that they're racist, mainly because of the situations with COVID. Um, as we look at how eugenics movement kind of rushed into the American education system, it created the believers and it didn't with very little evidence. And so they created these standardized assessments like IQ tests to demonstrate that white students are superior. As we know, the SAT and the ACT are also forms of this movement and are biased. What do you think are some alternatives um, that should be used to replace these, these bias assessments? Another really great question. Um, and it, it's something I think about, it's something I actually uh, dealt with when I was in, in high school. Um, you know, uh, I eventually got the score that I needed on the ACT, but the first couple of times, you know, I, I didn't perform as well as my teachers and my parents, especially my father, thought that I would perform. Um, and some of it is, is like exposure, right? So how do, when we know that these biases exist, how do we deal with them? Um, and maybe a, another part of standardized testing that we're not talking about, it's really hard to come up with, I think, a, a blanketed system that measures performance. And there's really no, uh, you know, when you get into metrics and, and, and uh, things of this nature in, in current society, we, we hear it with, you know, sports all the time. What do the metrics say about a particular picture, pitcher or uh, a runner? Uh, Bert, you, you know about that. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. what about, uh, you know, LeBron James? How many times does he, does he shoot three-pointers in the first quarter, right? Like, what, what are these things... But I think sometimes we get lost in the numbers and we still aren't thinking about the holistic individual. So the replacement for that, I think has to, I think uh, finding ways to make our grading system uh, more representative of where a student is and not simply to track them, but to put them in a situation when given all the optimal resources to succeed. So how do you, how does a rising tide lift all boats in a situation? Mm -hmm. And I think if we do that, you don't really need um, the standardized testing. There, there are some universities now that don't, no longer use the GRE. Right. right? I think GRE to go to grad school. Um, and even with that, and I'll, I'll talk about myself here, um, you know, there were some concerns that, that, well, his test wasn't, his score wasn't high enough, but I had straight A's. And that became the, the eventual uh, uh, tool that they used to measure how successful I might be in graduate school, okay? Um, and so, and, and again, in that situation, I had advocates, I had champions that were fighting for me that said, hey, Vernon is more than capable to do this work. His test score, uh, you know, it could be higher, but what does this really measure? I know folks, they got perfect scores from GRE that, that didn't finish the program with me. Mm -hmm. Right, um, and that's not to 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 knock them or to say that they weren't capable, 
but I, I think we have to come up with some different sorts of metrics. And just think about the notion of metrics to begin with, right? When we talk map testing. Well, what does a map test look like for students that are in Ladue versus map testing that's being done in North St. Louis? Yeah. Right? Because if we talk about the whole of a child and the, are they getting food in the morning? Are they getting breakfast? Are they getting are they going back home to an environment that doesn't allow them to study? Are they going to a place that where they have food, clothing, shelter, right? You know, like those very fundamental things that we need as human beings. And so I think it's, we have to revise these systems so that they provide and reward um, districts that are engaging at the very things I'm talking about, that they're getting at these kids um, where they are and lifting them up not pushing them down and segmenting them or segregating them into uh, tracks that they're never going to get out of, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. My second question goes, kind of blends with that, but I think you really answered that. It's um, to explain how the new eugenics affect Black students in assessments. You kind of spoke to that a little bit, but if you want to elaborate on that a little more, you can. Could you assessments in, in what way? Just uh, the new eugenics, which is what we're oh, yeah. doing now. How does in assessments, you've kind of really spoke to that, just how does that affect, and I guess you spoke to it in terms of um, how it holds our students down, you know, they, because of just the expectations. So th this is what I, I'll say to that. We need the same type of energy that folks put together to vote for the presidential election. You need to use that same energy when your board of education is needed. You need to use that same energy when uh, the board is being selected, right? When you're voting for board members. Um, and what I'm really getting at is that we all have to be accountable uh, in this situation. This is not up for kids. These are adults who are creating policies that are really punitive and damaging to any future possibilities for these children. And I'm, a key, I'm not saying students on purpose. Um, these are children, these are human beings and if we really believe that we want them to succeed, we have to start asking those kinds of questions um, in these boardrooms, uh, in these meetings. But a lot of times these policies are created and some of it is, you know, it becomes based off metrics. Others are taken and, and they're punitive in their very inception, right? And so I think at the same time, there's also this latent racism these, these self-fulfilling prophecies about uh, yeah. certain segments of the population, whether they be black or brown or poor, right? That they can't do the work. So we're gonna put, we're gonna create a system um, that allows them to just move along. And we, you know, we don't want that. We want, uh, you know, a society, I would think, most people, no one would say, that you don't want your child to not be successful. No one says, you know what, I don't want y'all to be successful. No, you do want your children to be successful. And when I say your children, that's how we have to look at this. So um, even if that's not biologically your child, this is a child in your society and inherently you should be invested in their success. Yeah. And putting the, the, the resources and the persons around them to, 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 to reach their potential. And it, that should be limitless. It shouldn't just be, well, we, we gave them a, a free and reduced lunch. That's just the beginning. That's a starting point. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think really fighting, and this goes back to the construction of policy, having people in the room who are going to fight and right. be champions for those kids. Like, I'm here again because I had champions, not just my father, but I had champions that were really, really willing to go to bat for me throughout my educational career. Even now, I still have you know mentors, but, but folks that, um, and, and again, I, I'm not exceptional. I think that what's exceptional are the people who are invested in me. And every child deserves the opportunity to have that investment, to be filled up with the type of love and concern that I was. Um, now, it may be hard to believe because of my bow tie and my glasses that <laughs> I did some things the wrong way sometimes. I did. Um, and so people love me through 
uh, bad decisions that I made as a, a student. I, I see that uh, Mr. M. Buchanan is, is on here. Dr. M. Buchanan is, is, is watching. And uh, Mr. B, as we call them, he was my trigonometry teacher when I was at McClure High School. Um, he is a, a perfect anecdotal example of the types of educators who are committed to their students. He held a, uh, a study hall for anybody that would come. And we would stay there with him until all of our work was done. Athletes, some of the students who were doing really well in class was happening. And again, I'm, I'm shining a lighter on, on uh, Mr. V as we call him, but I think it rings true. You need people that were invested in us back then, also in the same room with the superintendent, in the same room with the Board of Education, right. and the same room with your state reps. So that when things go awry, and they are, are leaning on these ideologies that are predicated on pseudoscience, who is going to be an advocate for these kids and really be an advocate? Okay. So um, we're now going to take some questions that we have that have um, actually, some have actually been texted to me as well. Um, and Shonda, um, if you hey, want to, Let me yeah, take let's take some from the chat and then we will go from there. So this question is, given the challenges within our educational system that fosters inequity within education that harms minority students, what are examples of supplemental activities um, or enrichment activities, um, educational support do you recommend that parents today do to mitigate the negative impacts of the current educational system? So we've, spoke, we've spoken uh, most of the conversation about it from an educational lens. Mm -hmm. what can parents do to pour into their kids and to provide some supplemental activities um supplemental sorry supplemental activities i think you know kind of run the gambit um getting kids to you know st louis is it, if you've not left st louis you don't really understand how uh privileged we are to have the institutions the free institutions that we have around of course i'm talking about the zoo the art museum the Science Center, Botanical Gardens, uh, and other, other uh, metro areas that you are paying top dollar to get in those types of situations, getting those, those types of institutions. And so I think those are, that's one uh, quick way that you can begin to do that. Um, that was a place that my, those are places that my parents, you know, took me to. Um, and it wasn't just about, you know, let's go see the animals at the zoo. Well, sometimes we had to write reports about those animals that were in that zoo. Right, um, and, and uh, I was going to the library. Um, I, my father would drop me off at the library in Ferguson. He would drop me off at the library uh, in Florissant, uh, Berkeley. Um, and I had to come out there with some books and I had to tell him about those books. And so I think those are, those are small ways to, to engage your child, um, to get that, that brain and that mind uh, uh, working, and I think reading uh, is key. Um, and then having very real conversations about how your, your child is feeling where they are, right? Because I, I don't want to get, my point is not just to say, read a book and it'll save you. No, we have to, I think in, in this moment, we have to look at the, the 360 degrees around, you know, a child and pour into them in those places where we see uh, deficits as they articulate them to us. So uh, just if you know, the child is in need of, of a mental uh, health expert, find ways to get that resource to that child. You know, talk about those types of things to, to, to have to deal with, with mental health doesn't make you crazy. It doesn't make you less than everybody deals with some type of depression or some type of moment or some people deal with it for years, you know? And I, I think that um, those small things, having real and honest conversations, but sometimes, you know, working families where uh, the parents of a child are both working or whoever's raising the child, everybody's working, the kids just, just kind of lost in the, the, the mix there. But for parents that are trying to be active, I think it's about, finding out what your, what your child is listening to, find out what they're watching, why they're watching it, and be invested in that way, 
when I was in high school, my dad would ask me all the time, what are you listening to right now? I would say Outkast was a, a, a group that I listened to a lot <laughs> then. And I remember coming back from college um, and my dad was listening to Kanye West. And I, <laughs> he, I was drop out. He had that, for those who knew my father, driving around that, that big black truck that he had, he was playing college dropout. And I, I, look, I shook, well, shake my head, I was like, Daddy, why are you listening to this? He said, you know what? This boy got something to say, I like him. And, but my father was naturally kind of inquisitive about what was moving me. Because what was moving him, a generation prior to, was very different. Um, but I think to answer the question again, parents have to find ways, uh, creative ways to engage their child. But I think in St. Louis in particular, it's going to these institutions to just get away from your community and to go like to the art museum, for instance, not that you will become an, an, an artist. It's, if you do it, it's awesome. But just to, what does it mean to be around cultural expressions? Do the, do the expressions of, of, of art look like me? Why don't they? If they do, why do they? Um, and I think allowing a student to, to do that, to see that, allowing a child to, to see that shows a different type of appreciation for them. And um, I'll, I'll say this, that I have three small children and um, two of my, ch my kids are very much, I can do it myself. They are becoming incredibly independent, at, you know, at two and three and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's funny. But I think that's always true. Uh, children are looking for ways to, to do it themselves. And I think that as parents, you can help facilitate that through these institutions. Each of the institutions I mentioned in St. Louis, right, they are free and they have pamphlets that will allow you. And I would even say this, create a curriculum for your child based upon uh, what their, their likes and their dislikes. And begin to engage them in that way. Why don't you like this? Why does someone like it? Well, that's, you need to give me a reason why you don't like it. And have a conversation about mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. It's not to, to, to be forceful, but to get them to expand their own horizons. Because again, I think that the, the job one is creating critical thinkers. Yeah. Or as my father would say, lifetime learners. Yeah. So uh, a couple of colleagues from this from Kirkwood School District uh, have questions. I'm gonna try to get them both to you and then get back in the chat. We got quite a few propping up here. So I wanna make sure I try to get those in. It's about 7.09, so I wanna try to get all those questions in. Um, Curtis O'Dwyer, as you know, uh, is a teacher in the Kirkwood School District. He asked, uh, why isn't eugenics discussed as much today? I think because America's ashamed of it. If you saw the video um, with, uh, Dr. Glaude, Professor Glaude, that's it. We don't want to have that conversation. We've created comfortable narratives centered around uh, heroic deeds or, or uh, th th these mythologies about what America is instead of talking about this underbelly um, that's been facilitated around the construction of whiteness, about the construction of uh, in the, uh, an inherent inferiority about uh, blackness, right? Um, and if we address them, right, like he says, we can be free from this. We can begin to get free from it. I mean, it won't just happen in a snap of a, of a finger, um, but I think they don't teach it because it's painful. Yeah. And people don't, I think instructors and public education in general, uh, we don't, we like, nice clean narratives. The pilgrims came in. They, you know, they, they met with the native indigenous population. They had the first Thanksgiving. That is so far from truth. Like, you know, you're replicating these myths and these stories that sound like bedtime stories and not really dealing with that, the, that life is full of beauty, struggle, and sometimes pain. Uh, and sometimes, not sometimes, the way we begin to deal with these traumas is to talk about them, educate about these traumas. Again, my presentation was not to say that, um, was just to provide, it was just to provide context. That, that's really all that was. It, it's not, and if we, we have the context, we can begin to think critically about 
uh, the world around us. And so the reason I, I don't think that eugenics is talked about, because I didn't really you know, know about eugenics until I got to grad school. It wasn't something that was really talked yeah. about in college. Yeah. You yeah. know, I think I had one class that, that may have touched on it, but um, we don't do well with dealing with nuance. Just humanity, I think in general, doesn't. We want the good guy, the bad person, you know, these binaries. And life is not binary. It is multi-fluid. It is always changing. And um, we have to, I think, again, begin to, to push the envelope in these boardrooms and uh, or board meetings uh, to challenge why we aren't covering these things. Because I don't think he, a, a child should, should get to college and it's the first time they hear, or go to grad school, the first time they hear about eugenics, right? Um, I'm jump in here with, with a question real quick, uh, Roberta. Was, yes. Was, so um, when you started off in your presentation, speaking about eugenics, you um, actually gave us the history and laid out how carefully um, it is tied to social Darwinism. So the theory of survival of the fittest. Mm -hmm. uh, and I guess my question is just thinking about today in America, do you see any parallels? Uh, we hear a lot about because we're dealing with COVID, like herd mentality, right? Yeah. Um, and how it, we know it disproportionately impacts uh, people of color. Um, and there just appears to be this apathy in supporting safety precautions to mitigate the disease. And so I was just was wondering, do you think that you know, part of this is steeped in this kind of racist ideology and there's a co correlation between this and what we're seeing with the pandemic and yeah. COVID, um, yeah. and, and eugenics, excuse me. Yeah, I, I, absolutely, absolutely. When, uh, the, when the, the populations that were greatest affected from COVID, when those studies were coming out and said it was hitting black and brown communities, my, you know, my head sank, my, my shoulders went down because I knew that the rest of the country will write this off. Well, this, this is them. America does a great job in um, otherizing folks, right? And as long, that's them, that's not us. Not here, we don't have to deal with that. And that shouldn't be the case at all. That goes back to what I said about, you know, dealing with, with kids in, the, in these uh, school districts. We need to be looking at citizenship in the same way. We are all part of the same block, if you will, right? And if we see, uh, understand the notion of shared humanity, we can begin to say, okay, when COVID is devastating New York City, hey, we're gonna send all the resources we can to help our fellow Americans, right? Not our, uh, our we say our fellow Americans who, who happen to be black, our fellow Americans who happen to be uh, whatever the identity is, right? Um, because many, some of us have several different uh, formations of our identity and that's amazing and that's beautiful, but it shouldn't be, well, we're not gonna worry about it because that's, that's, that's them. That's the inner city. And that's coded language too. That's the kind of stuff that they throw around. But where, do you, where does that come from? It comes from the stuff I'm telling you about right now. They started formulating the, the individual, those white men that I showed earlier, were putting together a program that they believe was gonna put um, America on the map. We're gonna create this perfect society. And the society in which they were talking about was not inclusive, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, when we see this happening, you know, in our present situation, we have to call it out. That's what's happening. Um, the response to COVID, I believe, would have been very different if it had been happening in rural areas and in Great Plains, right? Because you look at um, South Dakota, North Dakota, Montana, those places are all red with COVID when you look at those uh, scenarios. And, you know, they also are hospitals to capacity right, or hospitals have been closed, so they're coming into, into urban areas. We see that happening here in St. Louis. You have people from a rural areas coming into Washington University to take advantage of, you know, world-class care, as they should. Um, but when we, when one of us is, is hurting, we all should be hurting, right? They shouldn't be like, oh, my dear, look at those. No, it should, how can we help? But a lot of times, um, we don't do that. That's not how uh, we engage. And it even happens in, in, in uh, here in St. Louis, right? Yeah. You know, how is my school district doing? Well, what about that other school district over there? 
if if Rock uh, Rockwood is doing something, St. Louis Public needs to be in that same place. Mm -hmm. And if it's not, why isn't that case? Right. Kirkwood should be having the same numbers that Jennings does. And if Jennings not, is not where Kirkwood is, how do we make sure that those children can, you know, how do we address these gaps that we're seeing? Instead of most of the times though, uh, the response to, to the gap is punitive discipline, yeah. right? And that is predicated on us. Now, if that was flipped and, and let's just say that the test scores in, in some of the school districts in St. Louis that are, are not performing that well, if that was happening in a place like Ladue or Clayton, what would happen? <laughs> All hands on deck. We're gonna we're gonna yeah. deal with this. We're gonna, right? Why don't you have that same energy when it's, it's, it's other people that 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 uh, don't look like you yeah. or live in a different location? Mm -hmm. Those are the and why is that the case? Because just like going back to Dr. Glaude again, we're gonna be back here every generation dealing with the same thing. Because we really don't want to be free. We want to live in a, in a, a dream world where there is no real engagement with the righteousness of somebody's very existence. Everybody deserves the ability to be able to be the best person themselves. I keep saying this because I believe it. But when you strip them of that and you say, well, well, look at those people. Why is that the case? Well, let's let's look at the at the environment that they're that they're coming from, right? Because the first thing that comes up is personal accountability. That's what people throw out. Well, if they take it more accountability, well, when you're in a situation when you're uh intergenerationally impoverished, you know. And it's not, you know, the notion about, well, um, uh, we, we can get out through sports or through these other things. And those are missing lessons, too. You know, uh, so anyway, I, I think that the, the response to the question, again, it, it's <laughs> these questions are inherently racist. They are inherently yeah. uh, biased uh, by class and by race. Um, and they're fueled by these uh, by pseudoscience. And by a fear, that's why I call this, you know, education of fear. Yeah. They, these folks are scared. They don't want to deal with that because it's hard. We, you know, somebody in your family right now, Mike, if you hear my voice, something happened to you today that you don't want to deal with yet. Okay. That's just, uh, that's just human, um, that, that's just our existence. But mm -hmm. we have to be bold enough to face those fears for the sakes of these kids. And if we can't see these kids as our kids, capital O-U-R, that's a whole other question to deal with altogether. Because yep. we, we need to ask another question then. Yep. If you can't see these children as children who are capable of doing amazing things. And so you expect greatness, you will get greatness. Thank you. Thank you. There are two, uh, I, I, there are a few more in the chat and I'm looking at our time. Uh, but this one has been up for a while. This is Lakeisha Mitchell. I think you know who Lakeisha Mitchell is. Hey, cuz. Uh, she asked Dr. V. Calvin Mitchell, given the challenges within our educational system that fosters inequity within education that harms minority students, what are examples of supplemental act activities? Which I think you kind of talked about. Yeah, I think I already, already right? answered the question. Or, or um, but I'll finish the question off. Or educational support, do you recommend parents today do to mitigate the negative impacts of the current education system. I think uh, when Lakeisha asked that earlier, you hadn't gotten to that, but I, I, I'm pretty sure you've kind of touched on that. I asked her question from the chat. Yeah. Oh, okay, my bad. Willie Royal asked, given the volatile moment in history, how do we awaken enough blacks, whites and others to mount the institutional effort to avoid what is on the uh, precipice of a historical collapse due to white supremacy? And the second part, and I think you can see some of these, how can we help mount the institutional effort in St. Louis to make a substantial difference in black underachievement? Excuse me. Um, ooh, that's heavy. Um, yeah. <laughs> great question. And I don't, I don't have a, a real uh, short answer or, a, a, well, I'll answer it this way. And I'm being aware of time. Um, I think I said this in some of our conversations uh, before Roberta and, and, and Shonda, that we need coalitions. 
we need to look at education the same way we look at our political systems, right? Um, not everybody that voted is voting for the candidate that they may have particularly wanted. It's the candidate that they supported. And when we look at the, the, the rise of uh, President Barack Obama, we, you really talk about these coalitions happening. Uh, folks who otherwise may not have, you know, uh, worked together were finding ways to work together. And so in addressing um, the institutional effort here in St. Louis uh, and the difference in, in underachievement, we need coalition. And we need to, um, when I was involved with Ferguson uprisings, you know, education, organization, you need to act. And, and this is the same thing. This is no different than being on the street, right? Uh, because of uh, police uh, brutality, um, we have educational brutality happening, right? Um, what some might call COVID-1619. Uh, and to deal with that, we, we need to create coalitions of, of folks of goodwill who are willing to work. And then, uh, you know, I think the same way you canvass for a, a, a political uh, uh, candidate, you canvass for education. You know, what, what do you need and, and how do you find out what's important to parents? Um, and then find innovative ways to make them part of the conversation. One of the things that we've learned in this COVID environment is that we have a presentation like this right now. We are not all in the same place, yet you are listening to my voice and we are engaging in uh, an exchange about issues that are important to us, right? So uh, I think the same thing has to happen to begin to dismantle the effects of these systems. And, and I'll say this, we need to remember that these systems, structural uh, white supremacy, structural inequality, these systems are not just maintained by policies and statutes. They're maintained by people who wrote them, yeah. people who enforced them. And so my point is, it's people. Right, these systems are, are, and even like ourselves, we're part of, of the system at the same time. So how do we begin to speak and move in a way that allows for equity and equality in a system that, you know, I won't say the system is broken. I think the system is working just the way it was supposed to work. Um, one of the things, and this is maybe kind of an aside, when you attach education to property values, there's inherently gonna be a problem there. That some places are worth more than others. The amount of money spent, and I can use Kenlock as an example. When Kenlock was, it was like 1965, how much they were spending per child and how much was being spent at Clayton per child, you know, it's like four or five times what they were spending in, in Kenlock. Well, why is that? Because they had more uh, 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 tax infrastructure to build from. But the problem with that is that you, you're gonna inherently always have inequality. So we have to come up with a different way, uh, you know, to kind of equalize or have a, a, like you see this with, with some professional sports profit sharing, right? So whether I'm at Bashan, I'm at Kirkwood, McClure South Berkeley, or, you know, Hazelwood Central, right? I should be able to get the same level of resources and education uh, for that student, for that child. But that's not what happens though. And so I think to address that, you have to find out how these decisions are being made, right? That's the education piece. You organize, okay, they have a bond issue coming up. You get folks to, um, the, the, to the booth, right? And then the action is the franchise. That is still in American society, the most valuable asset we have. And some people will continue to say that my vote doesn't matter. You know, my one vote is not, if your vote didn't matter, folks wouldn't be working so hard to take it from. Hmm. If votes didn't matter in North St. Louis, they, they wouldn't even be, we wouldn't have this conversation, right? But they do matter. And so that folks are trying to take that valuable thing from you and what those persons of goodwill who Dr. King and John Lewis talk about the beloved community, if you are interested and invested in creating a beloved community, how do you begin to galvanize that support? Again, I'm gonna say it, education, organization, and then it's action. 
So uh, before you ask uh, the next one, um, we have about mm, four minutes left and we've got some more people in the chat. And I, at the end, I do want you to give some sort of call to action on what we need to, what, what you know, kind of what can be done mm -hmm. or how do we look at this? So um, uh, Shonda, would you like to get the next couple of people in the chat and then, we, then we'll close it out? Because there's some really good questions the left. Theme, I think you were already kind of uh, talking about this. And so just to expound on it a little bit more, the question is, do you think that redlining, racial covenants, and the like um, are types of systemic geographical eugenics? To, to the last part again. So do you think like redlining, um, racial covenants, mm -hmm. and the like, you know, things like that, um, do you think that those are types of systemic geographical eugenics? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, because you have to ask the question of why did they create racial covenants, which was here in St. Louis. Right. Um, and, and for those that don't know, a racial covenant was the, you would sign as a covenant, a form saying that I would not sell my property to anybody that was not white. Okay. But what does that do? That creates an environment where everybody that's there is going to be white. Even if you leave and buy property somewhere else, the person buying their property will be white. So you create these homogeneous communities that are, that are, you know, kind of replicating themselves. Um, redlining, oh, well, th this community is not really um, fit for uh, investment, right? Uh, if we look at what's happened in North County, right? The majority of people who, who the, the white flight out of North County is now St. Charles. Most of the folks who live in St. Charles used to live in Ferguson, used to live in Hazelwood, right? Why? Why'd they go out there? Right, and this is the uncomfortable stuff that folks in St. Louis don't want to talk about, but we're going to talk about. It. You have to be in a situation um, that begins to demand a a respect for the humanity of all of us. Right, you can live wherever you want to live. You know, my my thing is not to uh, besmirch folks that that want to move to move further west or folks that want to move back into the city. You live where you want to live. But it shouldn't be exclusionary, right? Um, and I think, yes, to, to answer the question again, it, it is predicated on the very notion, because if they, if they thought that, and they, when I say they, but who is they? This is banks, this is real estate agents, right? Um, other types of investors, right? If, if they thought that it, it wouldn't be profitable, or they thought it was profitable, you wouldn't see those things there. But the exclusion inherently begins to create a different type of profit. Well, if we get all these people to move to St. Charles, we can free this up, right? And I'm talking about like by, by the year 2000, you see a, this big shift starting to happen. I saw it when I was in high school. Um, places that had not been redlined were now redlined. What is that shift about? You're just moving the pot around, right? And, and people are they become invested in, you know, um, uh, the politics of race, right, in some uh, very visceral regard, and that and that's what animates a place like St. Louis, right? We're so I think the fourth most segregated city in the country, and that segregation is again animated by racial animus, right? I don't want to live next to those people, right? We're otherizing folks again, and so the redlining of stuff is is predicated on the very things I thought about. So if I if I if I own a bank, I'm not gonna give to a place that I think, or to a, a section of the society of a, uh, that I don't think is is worthy of my investment. And if you begin to ask the question, why aren't they worthy of your investment? How is uh, uh, Jennings now different than um, some place off Darty Ferry right, or South South County? What what, what makes that different? Right, because if you drive down Big Bend all the way, you see houses look just like houses you see off uh, Genesis Station Road, all the way down there. What, what's the difference? Mm -hmm. The people who live there, right? How did they create that? It's a very intricate system, but that system is predicated on the fact that African Americans, in particular, and I'm talking about St. Louis now, that Black folk have been historically viewed as outside the parameters of citizenship, right? And then I would even say uh, outside the parameters of being human. So 
you definitely won't be seen as being uh, as a, 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 a member of, of society, right? A pr productive member of society. Well, I'm going to put investment there. These people are inherently not part of what we're supposed to do. These, these folks are not part of uh, the myths about what America is supposed to be, right? And that's social mobility. So uh, redlining and, and restrictive covenants uh, were just tool vessels, uh, the, the newest iterations of, uh, of eugenics, right? And, it, and the thing is, again, eugenics is a pseudoscience created to facilitate cover, right? That people could believe in this as a way to not have to care about or a notion about shared humanity for all uh, of people in this society and to exclude. And that exclusion comes at a price. It's trauma, it's, it's, uh, it's money, right? Which is a different type of trauma. Um, but yeah, so I, I think absolutely uh, those practices are rooted in in the the insidious history of eugenics. Well, yeah, <laughs> there's a lot to, um, a lot to unpack, uh, Shonda. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I knew you were getting ready to say thank you. We're not going to be able to get to those other questions, but um, just to close, first of all, thank you so much, everyone that 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 were able to stay on with us. And and um, how could um, if, if some of the questions that we didn't get answered tonight, if they would like to email you. Can you put your information in the chat, perhaps, your email? Yes, I, I will do that right now. And uh, for the questions that we didn't get to, would you please send those questions uh, to Dr. Mitchell? I'm sure he'll be happy to uh, answer that for you. I do want to um, uh, uh, remind everyone that we do have, uh, we will not have a speaker series until um, December coming up. And I believe our next date is January 19th, but please check the website. Uh, that is on BIPOC. That's uh, being able to unpack what that means. And we'll have representatives of the Black, Indigenous, um, Asian, um, as well as Native American um, and Latinx on a panel. So check the website for those details. And thank you all for, for, for hanging with us and kind of rolling with us through, through the technical difficulties that we had. I'm, I'm sure you all learned um, much this evening. Would you like to close it out, Dr. Shonda Ambrose Phillips? Well, um, I just, again, thank you, uh, Dr. Mitchell. Um, I think it's very challenging to work through technology issues. And <laughs> you did a fantastic job of, of pivoting and, and bringing all the information together. One of the things that um, unfortunately our participants did not have an opportunity to see was that video that uh, of, of the KKK in 1925, and we are actually coming up to a century, right? Um, in 2025 of when that march took place. And I know we had Charlottesville in 2017 that was reminiscent of, of that, at least in my lifetime. And so I think for a lot of the viewers today, this was an opportunity for us to kind of think back about eugenics and how it's impacting us today. Um, and we really appreciate the wisdom that you bestowed upon us. And so I just wanna thank you again. Um, for those who can tune in, uh, join us uh, for our next speaker series. And um, again, um, thank you on behalf of the district and everyone that's that's uh, viewing today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's been my pleasure. Oh, it's awesome. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Good night. Good night. <laughs>